Uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my group's work on drinking water distribution systems and specifically honing in on some of the ways that this support from the USGS 104B program has allowed us to make progress in terms of how we can study microbial biofilms within those systems. So my group uh, works a lot with rural and small systems in the state and region. And so part of the reason for that is that uh, rural communities in general, but specifically rural and low income communities are disproportionately affected by violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And if you look at what these violations are, this study that was published a couple years ago in the Journal of the American Water Works Association that pulled data from 2013 from systems serving less than 10,000 people demonstrates that the most common uh, cause of Safe Drinking Water Act violations for small utilities is the total coliform rule. So total coliforms, these are bacteria that are present in fecal matter as well as soil. And um, the total coliform rule mandates that utilities have to perform monitoring uh, for these bacteria throughout their distribution system as a way to indicate if there's contamination from pipe breaks or intrusion going on. And so it's important to note that these total coliform rule violations indicate issues in the distribution system rather than, you know, issues with the source water quality or with the treatment process. They indicate problems out in the distribution system. And so this really highlights that managing distribution system water quality is a big challenge um, for small utilities in particular. And so if there's one thing I, you know, want you to take away from this presentation today, it's this idea that um, drinking water distribution systems are actually really complex ecosystems where there's lots of different um, biological and chemical changes happening. And in fact, water quality can change quite markedly as water travels from the treatment plant to the tap. And so some of the things that can happen are microorganisms can grow in this environment. They can form biofilms on the inside of drinking water pipes. Uh, we have, you know, disinfectants that we intentionally dose into drinking water to kind of help control this problem. But as water moves further and further away from the treatment plant, those will decay and even react with organic matter to form disinfection byproducts. Uh, we can also have accumulation and transport of sediment and loose deposits throughout um, distribution systems. And you know, this all might sound a little bit scary, but I just want to reassure you this is quite normal. We've studied, um, you know, a variety of different distribution systems from around the country, from um, small systems and large systems. Um, and we've we've even studied some uh, really advanced treatment systems and find that this is the case in all of these cons uh, all these systems. And this is consistent with being in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. So in and of itself, this is not something to worry about but it's something that my research team is really interested in understanding better because the more we understand these changes that are happening, you know, the more we can inform best practice for how to best manage water quality within distribution systems. And so over the last couple of years, I've had a couple master students who have studied this issue of um, bacteria out in the drinking water distribution system. And so here I'm showing some um, data we did monitoring from one small system here in West Virginia. And we've got data from a number of different dates, but I picked one here just to show you that really everywhere we looked throughout this system, you know, we detected levels of bacteria, sometimes as high as um, about 10,000 copies of bacteria uh, genes that we're looking for as indicators of live bacteria uh, per milliliter of water. So we can see quite a lot of bacteria uh, in these systems. And this was work led by my student, Erica, you can see here. And I had another student, Maddie, who followed up on this to ask the question, okay, what are all these bacteria out in the distribution system? And she used DNA sequencing of these samples um, to profile all the different microbes present. And you can see that there's remarkable diversity in terms of what organisms are present in these samples. And the good news is that the vast majority of these are not known to be harmful in any way. And we uh, see that gamma proteobacteria and alpha proteobacteria were most common. And that's quite consistent with what we've seen with other systems from around the country. So nothing too surprising here other than the fact that um, you know, there's just this remarkable amount of diversity in these systems that we don't necessarily think of as microbially active. 
And so Maddie did some further investigation to kind of look at, you know, what's going on with these microbial communities, what is contributing to shaping them and determining which microbes are present at any given site. And um, she uh, did some really cool statistical analyses that I'll just kind of skim over for the sake of time right now. But she did this test called analysis of similarities. Um, and the result of that was that we found that dates and therefore like seasonal drivers of changes were actually not, not an important driver of changes in this microbial community, but that in fact, um, spatial variations were quite notable. So we were seeing more consistency in terms of the microbial community we detected at a given site from date to date, more so than we were seeing that like, oh, in August, all the dates look like this compared to in March when they look this other way. So that was a bit surprising. We thought date uh, was going to be a more dominant factor. And so there's a lot of literature to demonstrate that water quality is a really important driver of what happens with the microbial community. But we were really surprised to find that in fact, when we did some hydraulic modeling of this distribution system um, and kind of took all that data along with a bunch of water quality data we had taken from this system, we actually found that hydraulic drivers were much stronger predictors of microbial community than any of our water quality parameters. So things like velocity, flow rate, and pressure um, were all correlated with bacterial diversity. And so we, we believe that the reason um, that we're seeing this is that these different hydraulic changes that might happen out in the system can contribute to uh, those biofilms on the inside of pipes kind of sloughing off, entering the water that we're able to detect. So what's going on with hydraulics, it turns out, does seem to be really important for what we're actually finding when we collect these water samples. And so all of that is uh, just kind of background to set up what our goals for this project were and why, you know, why we care about this issue of kind of better trying to understand biofilms and distribution systems and what the role of hydraulics are in determining that. And studying drinking water distribution systems is very challenging because, uh, you know, in at least um, uh, this part of the world, those are consistently buried, and so they're quite hard to get to, hard to access, uh, really hard to get those biofilm samples. And so within the scope of this project, my PhD student, Vanilla um, Vossum, was looking to evaluate the role of hydraulic conditions in drinking water distribution systems on biofilm formation and associated impacts to water quality. And so in order to tackle this question, we used a lab scale approach to kind of simulate some of those hydraulic changes that we're seeing in distribution systems. And um, to start off, we are starting with just pure culture biofilms. Eventually we hope to make that a little bit more complex like we would see in a distribution system, but we picked uh, the model drinking water organism, Pseudomonas fluorescens. It's found quite frequently in drinking water. Um, it's is really good at forming biofilms and um, it is typically not a pathogen but it is closely related to pseudomonas originosa which is a pathogen we find in uh, drinking water and so we're interested in it for that reason you know it maybe it can tell us something about an organism that is relevant to human health and what we're doing is we're using these biofilm reactors um, these biofilm reactors are uh, manufactured by Biosurface Technologies uh, Corporation. And what they do is um, that we use stir plates to simulate the flow that happens in a distribution system. And each of these has 24 coupons that are just surfaces that can be removed from this for us to look at, okay, if we um, create higher shear stresses, how does that affect the properties of these biofilms forming on the coupons within these reactors? So it gives us you know, much more control than we would have out in a distribution system. We can kind of simulate that at the lab scale. And the reason we picked these um, reactors over similar ones that are sometimes used is that there's been um, a lot of work to really demonstrate that these do a great job at allowing us to simulate uniform shear stress on all the different coupons within this system. And so that's that's really helpful for being able to compare lots of different conditions. And so what we're working on is comparing different conditions where we're looking at constant shear stress, so low shear stress, moderate shear stress, and high shear stress to simulate what happens to these biofilms when water flows past them out in the distribution system 
but we're also looking at variable flow conditions. So alternating back and forth between low and moderate and low and high shear stress to simulate the fact that out in a distribution system, we see big changes in the flow rate and the velocity of water moving at different times of the day. You know, everyone uh, perhaps gets up and showers first thing in the morning. And so there's going to be a lot uh, more water flowing through the pipes and higher shear stress to the biofilms in those pipes at that time of day compared to late at night when there's not a lot of water being used. So that's what we're trying to simulate here is seeing if some of what we saw in that real world uh, monitoring, we can replicate uh, at the bench scale. And we care about this, um, you know, from the perspective of controlling microorganisms, but we also are really interested in looking at controlling disinfection byproduct formation. This is a reaction that happens when chlorine disinfectants react with organic matter to form disinfection byproducts. And um, I'll circle back to why that relates to biofilms here in a second, but we know that uh, these disinfection byproducts tend to form out in the distribution system. Here's some data from the EPA that shows that the farther we get away from a treatment plant, shown as moving to the right on this plot, the more total trihalomethanes can be detected. But this gets really complex because other disinfection byproducts like haloacetic acids, uh, will sometimes follow a different trend. They can be subject to biodegradation. And so having microbes present is really relevant um, for whether or not these haloacetic acids stick around. And there are other reasons we care about biofilms. Uh, when bacteria decide to attach themselves to the inside of a pipe, they will often emit these extracellular polymeric substances that are kind of a sticky matrix uh, that allows them to adhere um, to that surface, but that can be a source of organic carbon that we believe might be contributing to formation of these DBPs out in the distribution uh, system. So those are some of the hypotheses, some of the reasons we care about this issue of biofilms in the distribution system. And so within this project, um, we encountered a lot of challenges. And so really, we spent a lot of our time focused on some method development, and so some of the things that we were able to achieve during um, this project period were we made a lot of progress in how to optimize these reactors for growing these biofilms. Simulating a low nutrient environment like drinking water is, is very challenging. And so that took a bit more um, trial and error than we were expecting, but we've got a good protocol in place for that now. And Vanilla has also put a lot of hard work into optimizing some of the other methods that we're gonna use for this project, such as extracting those extracellular polymeric substances, quantifying disinfection byproducts, and even using scanning electron microscopy for biofilm visualization. And so here you can see some examples of some of the biofilms she's grown in her reactors, where you can see our Pseudomonas fluorescence, but you can also see some of that biofilm matrix that we think is relevant because of it um, being able to act as a source of organic carbon. And so our next steps, um, I, I'm really grateful to the support from the USGS and the Water Research Institute because it allowed us to work out some of these issues that we were having, generate some preliminary data on this subject and kind of be a proof of concept um, that I use as a basis for part of my recent National Science Foundation Career Award, where we're going to be evaluating this uh, further. And so we're going to continue working on this and hopefully have some more solid answers about some of these questions we have through the use of continued field and lab scale studies. And so uh, I will wrap up there, but thanks for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Emily. We do have a question in the chat. I think this is related to maybe slide eight or thereabouts, but for the hydraulic parameters slide with map, could you uh, talk about the legend of that map? Hmm, so I'm curious if you mean this one or this one. Maybe both. Let's cover both. Yeah, so I, you know, it, I would love to dive into these in a lot more detail, and I just went over them rather quickly to give you kind of a sense of some of the, the data that we have that we're using as a basis of this. Um, but I'll start with this one. So we used uh, quantitative polymerase chain reaction to look at total bacteria in this system, and that's a method that looks directly at the DNA of microorganisms 
which has a lot of advantages and some disadvantages. The reason we really like it for this application is that we don't have to know what bacteria we're looking for. So we talked about the total coliform rule, um, which is really only informative if we've got some sort of intrusion of outside material or outside bacteria happening. But we wanna know what are those microbes that are actually well suited to growing in this environment? And so we chose to go with an assay that would detect all of those uh, bacteria, regardless of what you know genus or species they are. And so we quantified this 16S RNA gene that's present in uh, all bacteria as kind of an approximation of that. But it, it doesn't give us great insight into whether those bacteria are alive. Um, and so that's you know the key limitation of that method. And so um, I've got both a, a color scale and kind of a size of circle scale here. These are both indicating the same thing just to make this accessible in case, um, you know, color is not an easy uh, way to interpret this, this map for anyone. And so these are telling us about the logarithms of these 16S RNA genes. And so you can see that, um, you know, a lot of these look like they're falling between about um, three log and four log of these total bacteria detected out in the system. And then this one is um, uh, a bit rougher, <laughs> I will, I will uh, admit, but this legend is just a color coding where we are looking at pressure of this system. I believe it's in PSI. Um, and so these numbers are just assigning a color where if it's um, expected to be at this particular point in our in our model, if it's going to be a very low pressure at you know 38 psi, it's showing up as red. Uh, at the other end of the scale, if it's over 96 psi, it's showing up as gray. So um, this is just a snapshot in time. Thank you so much, Emily. Okay. Um, seeing no other questions at this time, we'll uh, let you head out because I know you have a class to teach. And uh, Mel and Mike, you're up next. I think my display is broken. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Strager had a fire alarm in his building, so he ran over to our building so he can help present me, present with me. So yeah, that's why there's that empty seat. Sorry about that. It was a true <laughs> fire alarm. <laughs> oh wow! Glad that you're safe and that you made it out. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mel. Ooh, I went all blurry. There we go. <laughs> my name is Mel. I am a water research technician here at WRI, but I started out as a student worker. And when I first came here, I my main project was implementing a stream flow monitoring program to inform management and conservation decisions in the Monongahela River watershed. So I'll be presenting and then Dr. Strager will be taking over, but the principal investigators were Brent Murray, Carol Arantes, Michael Strager, and Jason Philhart. So just to give a quick overview, we'll give you some background information, the field work that we did, the processing of that data from the field work, and the final result. So the Monongahela was a severely impacted river, but it rebounded through effective co collaborations with voluntary reductions of total dissolved solids. So it was delisted from the impaired streams list in 2014. But this was a fragile victory uh, as more restoration is needed to ensure the health of this watershed. And we found that insufficient monitoring uh, is out there to support and prioritize restoration and conservation efforts. In particular, flow data is needed throughout the watershed. So to fill this gap in stream flow data in collaboration with partners, we installed a network of stream gauges throughout the watershed. And this information will help to support three mapping, ap mapping applications, the 7Q10, the flow distance above public water supplies, and the water withdrawal tool. Uh, this flow data will help update the rainfall runoff model relationship and uh, by providing more flow data from ungauged tributaries. 
The data also will support ongoing studies here that are being done at the university and also support 3RQ water quality monitoring program here at WRI. So the specific objectives were to install 15 hobo water level loggers and presently ungaged and undergaged Monongahela River tributary systems or reaches. Uh, then we'll translate this water level data into discharge stream flow data and update the flow models and then make this data publicly available to government and industry partners. So to begin, we had to select 15 sites throughout the watershed. Uh, and we did this with our partners, the DEP, the DNR, Friends of Deckers Creek, and Friends of the Cheat. And the map to the right just shows the 15 sample locations, uh, their associated drainage areas, and the Huck 8 boundary of the Monongahela watershed. So we acquired 30 onset hobo U20L water level loggers. Uh, there are two loggers per stream. One goes into the water to record absolute pressure. Then another logger stays out to record barometric pressure. And then by subtracting the barometric pressure from the absolute pressure, we can convert the uh, stream data into water level in feet. For our study, we set the gauges to collect data at one hour increments. This would save um, battery life and storage capacity while still giving us a good portion of data. They can operate up to 30 feet with an accuracy of 0 0.03 feet, and they can function at temperatures of 32 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So then we actually went out and installed the gauges. A photo on the left is of a, one of our other students, Zach Kelly, who is imperative to this research. He was very helpful in the field installation, uh, and that's Beulah Hollow. And then there's we're installing a gauge on the right in a tree to get parametric pressure. After the gauges were installed, uh, we had to take discharge measurements. Three were needed for every stream. And then the infographic on the right just kind of explains how discharge measurements are taken. You take a cross section from a stream, divide that into subsections to get an area, and then you measure the velocity of the stream within that area, and then you can calculate this charge. So after we get the three stream discharge measurements, we pull the data from the loggers using the shuttle shown on the right. That way we can collect the data in the field, then bring it back to our computers in the office to you know, analyze the data. So the graph, the blue solid line shows water temperature, and then the solid black line below it shows absolute pressure. The dashed line shows the barometric pressure. And then doing the calculations between those two pressures, we can or get uh, stage in feet, which is the green line. This data can also be exported as a table, which is useful in our analysis. So now that we have the stage and the discharges from those streams, we can create a stage discharge rating curve. Um, and this is unique to each stream. <clears throat> And then once the rating curve is developed, we can use this to transform all the data collected from the gauge into streamflow in CFS, which is done using this equation here, the Q equals A times D to the B power. And this information is collected getting a linear regression through the log transform data. So as we collect the streamflow, we, uh, compare that to the stage on the data, transform that data into the log data, plot it, and then it gives you this equation, which then you, you know, plug back into the original equation. So we did this for all 15 streams, and then I passed it over to Dr. Strager so he could update the models. All right, thanks, Mel. So as you saw earlier in that graphic of the 15 site locations in the Mon River Basin, we delineated watershed catchments for everything upstream defined as that sample point as the pore point. So those were unique watersheds that had to be delineated for each of the locations in which the site has been, uh, has been sampled. So this table looks at each of those 15 sites and essentially creating some explanatory variables to better explain what were those drivers for the stream flow. 
were a function of um, many of the uh, variables that you see calculated here, specifically things related to um, land cover, as well as things related to the main input part on the hydrological cycle, which was precipitation. So the precipitation data we used uh, was 800 meter resolution from a Oregon State company, uh, PRISM. And that PRISM data set really enabled us to match the time period of the precipitation to when the data was sampled in the field. So we could come up with a relationship in that way. Next slide. So for each of those locations, again, shown here, again, defined by those four points um, that you see, we looked at the relationship then of how important or how different uh, precipitation drives what we see in the actual stream flow. So this is a technique that's been used uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of the watershed characterization and modeling system, as well as uh, for a lot of the applications that DEP TAGIS now uses, specifically ones related to low flow, uh, 7Q10, um, and other uh, flow events, which are critical, such as for time of travel, um, which has uh, been used essentially from uh, 10 years ago, the, uh, the spill on the Elk River, which ended in above ground storage tank regulations and so on, uh, looking at a three hour travel time above intakes. So a lot of spatial relationships and hydrological relationships have been built and the equations that have been applied for those use. And this approach in this study was an opportunity to update those with uh, a lot of the local data we had here in the MON. Again, we have a, a small caveat with this. This is a model that was done for the MON that can be used specifically for it and application of it to other places outside of that uh, Mon River drainage have still and would need to be tested and models developed for those. So what we're able to do in looking at this essentially rain, rainfall to runoff ratio, the Q of P, uh, you see for the different segments, uh, the locations and their drainage areas um, using essentially a depth and volume measurements that you see in that top graphic to get at our values uh, for that ratio. And interestingly, uh, regarding this ratio, we can combine this with all the other landscape variables that were combined for the watersheds. And as part of a principal component analysis, analyze what those ma major factors are and those models to drive the stream flow, and then apply that for different locations throughout the landscape. Now, the important part of that is that with that information, we can come up with an output, which looks like this graphic on the left. So what you're looking at is a, um, a raster representation of the vector stream locations. And it's done on essentially a, a, a 10 meter cell basis. So for every 10 meters step in the stream represented with those raster cells, as you can see, we could possibly have a different stream flow measurement. So again, this is very useful for being able to have modeled output for stream flow in sites that we have not sampled and we have not had gauges on. Uh, so very important for water withdrawals, time of travel, uh, 7Q10, or other stream flow that may have an ecological uh, importance and so on. And as part of our output, this information has been provided uh, to the DEP TAGIS for uh, use and applications for updating that relationship regarding water management plan uh, applications. There's 7Q10 flow estimate tool that's available. And then also the uh, flow distance above pu public water supplies. Uh, that flow distance has a step-by-step, a -step, very spatially explicit cell-based approach, similar to what we have here. And again, also the water withdrawal tool, uh, being able to find the assimilative capacity in the amount of water that exists at different time periods in the stream to determine if that is a site that could um, you know, handle a particular withdrawal at that uh, site location. So um, very uh, opportunity, opportunity to apply these uh, diff different and new ratios that we found for the MON for updating these particular applications that are um, available and uh, served out as part of DEP's TAGUS office. Yep. 
I just want to give a thanks to our funders, the USGS and the Colcom Foundations, and we'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you both so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat at this time. Um, so great job. And I'm going to turn things over to uh, Rachel for our third and final presentation today. Thanks, Becca. Can everyone see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Spernick. I'm a water resources specialist here at WRI, and I'll be presenting about another one of our projects, uh, evaluation of voluntary discharge management system for reducing high TDS events in the Mon River Basin. And I also just wanted to um, give a shout out to our team, um, especially Mel and Joseph Kingsbury, who's one of our former graduate students who did a lot of the statistical analysis and also Jason Philhart, who is the PI for this project. So uh, to set the stage for this project, there's a little bit of background information that's important to know, um, starting with the uh, summer and fall of 2008 and 2009, there were several high TDS events in the Monongahela River and its tributaries. Um, this even led to some municipal water authorities to shut down their intakes. There were exceedances of the EPA's Safe Drinking Water Act standards for TDS, which is 500 milligrams per liter. And there was also a major fish kill in Dunkard Creek, which is a tributary to the Mon. Uh, this fish kill was due in part to low TDS, or I'm sorry, high TDS, and the low flows, which contributed to a golden algae bloom, which is toxic to fish. Some potential drivers for these high TDS events, um, the Mon River Basin has a lot of abandoned mine drainage. It also has a lot of active mines with uh, treated discharges. Um, conventional AMD treatment removes metals and neutralizes pH, but it's not as effective at removing sulfate. So these treated mine discharges can still be high in TDS. Uh, we also have, and especially during this time, uh, there was a lot of increase in the oil and gas industry in this region. And then additionally, low flow conditions, uh, which may increase uh, an event due to climate change. And just quickly for those who may not know, TDS stands for total dissolved solids. And it's a measure of all organic and inorganic substances in the water. So in response to these high TDS events and not really knowing uh, which um, factor was the cause, WRI began a monitoring regime um, in July of 2009. At that time, it was biweekly. And it included the Monongahela River at key locations and also the mouths of major tributaries. Our sampling focused on TDS parameters, including metals, sulfate, and halogens, and it actually never stopped. So we continued monitoring since then. Uh, now we monitor monthly, and it's as part of our Through Rivers Quest program. Uh, and what we found pretty quickly after a few results came back was that the treated mine discharges were the controlling factor in the MONS TDS load. So these discharges were within their permitted limits. However, the extent of the discharges, uh, especially during times of low flow, was too much for the river to handle. And in response to this, we immediately began working with regional coal companies to uh, develop um, a solution that could be quickly implemented. And so we created a model that accounted for the pumping capacities of major mine companies and treatment plants in the upper MON. And our model was set not to exceed the Safe Drinking Water Act standard for TDS with a safety factor of two. And essentially it allowed for the plant operators to look at the gauge reading. So the 
discharge reading in the MON and use the model to know exactly what to set their pumps to, thereby coordinating the outflows of all of these systems and uh, maintaining the water quality in the MON. So this was implemented voluntarily very quickly um, by January 2010. Some other key management changes that occurred within the basin um, quickly thereafter. Uh, number one, Pennsylvania restricted the disposal of shale gas wastewater to publicly owned treatment works. And that occurred in 2011, I think in May. And um, this had a effect on some of our tributaries in Pennsylvania, and then also a small impact on the Mon main stem downstream. Um, so in the Pennsylvania region. And uh, this was especially uh, particularly important for bromide as those wastewater facilities weren't able to adequately treat the shale gas wastewater, especially for bromide. Another key management change that occurred was 2013 construction of a regional reverse osmosis treatment facility for mine discharges. And this was constructed by Consol Energy as part of the settlement as they were ultimately found responsible for the Dunkard Creek fish kill. And so this facility um, uses reverse osmosis rather than conventional uh, AMD treatment methods. And so the goals of this project are to evaluate the effectiveness of the voluntary discharge management program from 2010 to present. A lot of times passed since uh, its initial implementation. Uh, there have been changes in uh, industry, in management, and um, you know changes in flow in the river. So we wanted to reevaluate it and identify future recommendations. So we use existing data from the three RQ program from two thousand nine to twenty twenty two. This uh, was collected monthly and analyzed by a certified lab. We obtained flow from the nearest USGS gauge or using the WCMS model, uh, which was just talked about during the last presentation. And you can see in this table, the list of key sites that are impacted by the Voluntary Discharge Management Program, which I'll refer to as VDMP. And uh, it's a total of 13, including one control site. The data was cleaned in R using the MICE package, and then we performed some simple statistic, uh, I'm sorry, some simple regression analysis in Excel. We also are drawing from the results of our recently published study, uh, a lot of that work done by our student Joe Kingsbury, uh, and that study evaluated the management changes within the Mon River Basin uh, over 10 years. So very similar. Um, but it used a locally weighted polynomial regression in conjunction with the segmented regression to assess trends and change points. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the results of that study in this presentation, um, but it is a lot to fit in. So um, there was also a linear, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was also a linear mixed effect model that I won't have time to get to. So in the main stem, we saw that uh, actually from the time we started monitoring, TDS hasn't exceeded the standard of 500. And this figure shows all of our main stem sites in the MON as well as flow at one of those sites. And the black line shows the implementation of the VDMP where you can see a visible shift. Since um, the implementation of the VDMP Sulfate hasn't exceeded its standard of 250 milligrams per liter. So uh, at the beginning of our monitoring, sulfate had a few exceedances, but then once that VDMP went into place, there were no longer any exceedances. And these two bottom figures really just show the strong relationship between discharge and each of these parameters. Um, and so it's highly dependent on flow. As far as the tributaries go, we saw a lot of variability, um, both with the typical concentrations, 
and the trends for all of these tributaries. Um, but one commonality was that sulfate trends mirror TDS trends. So in the figures, I'm just going to show TDS. Um, but all of the tributaries showed uh, at least a small decreasing trend, though they varied in magnitude and st statistical significance. Uh, the tributaries with large negative trends included Dunkard Creek and Flaggy Meadows. So the Dunkard Creek TDS and sulfate levels improved visibly coinciding with implementation of the VDMP in 2010, and they've continued to improve ever since, um, notably not exceeding the standards since uh, late 2017. And I'll talk a little bit more about Dunkard in a future slide. Uh, however, um, despite some improvements, many of our sites, including these four, still had uh, very high TDS levels and sulfate levels uh, frequently exceeding the standards. Two of our sites displayed no trend, including our uh, control, which was White Day Creek and also 10 Mile Creek in Pennsylvania. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, average annual percent change or AAPC which indicates, um, as you may guess, the average yearly change in a parameter throughout the study period. So a positive value indicates an increase in the parameter and a negative value indicates a decrease. So for um, discharge, we saw increases at all sites, um, but for the other parameters with a few small exceptions, we saw decreases. And so um, one of the most significant decreases was Dunkard Creek, as you can see with sulfate and TDS. And uh, it also interestingly, Whiteley Creek showed significant negative values for not only sulfate and TDS, but also um, even greater so for bromide and chloride. Okay, and so this is the result of the um, locally weighted poly polynomial regression, <clears throat> which you can see those are the smooth green dots. Our raw data is the blue triangles. And then we also stacked the segmented regression line, which is the red line on top. So I know there's a lot to unpack with this figure. Um, but this is specifically for Dunkard Creek, and it includes um, our key parameters there. And um, this really is a, a nice way to show all of the different management changes and the different change points that have occurred. So in the blue dotted lot, dotted line, we have the implementation of the VDMP. And then you can see there was a bit of a delay, but you can see two change points happening after that for all of the parameters. And then in the pink dotted line, we have the opening of the reverse osmosis treatment facility, um, which had uh, further improvements on Duckard Creek. We have Whiteley Creek also, and I think this is the last figure I'm going to show. Um, and it just shows a similar trend to Dunkard with those uh, management changes and those change points. So some key takeaways, uh, we saw substantial improvements at some heavily impacted sites, including Dunkard Creek, Whiteley Creek, and Flaggy Meadows Run. Um, TDS and sulfate concentrations within the Mon River proper haven't exceeded the standards since the implementation of the VDMP. Um, and it was also delisted for sulfate as a result, uh, partially to that in 2014. The RQ data was actually used um, to help with the delisting. And, and so this confirms that voluntary T TMDLs are effective inexpensive and rapid remedial actions. And it serves as a justification of the importance of continuing this program and continuing to um, encourage the participation, voluntary participation of the coal industry. Some future directions, we are still, um, there's so much data to go through with this. So we are still um, taking a closer look at those tributaries to identify um, the different uh, the reasoning behind the variability. So 
Um, it could be attributed to a great number of factors. It could be, um, you know, within the mining operation and how strictly they're following the VDMP. It could just be the number and size of treatment facilities has changed. Uh, it could be mine level, mine pool level variability or um, changes in flow to the stream, outside influences. Uh, there's a lot of different factors. Uh, another future direction, we want to uh, continue to partner with our coal industry partners and possibly um, uh, expand to some additional uh, partnerships and um, just continue to, uh, within our models, possibly incorporate some other management changes that have occurred. So uh, if you want to learn more, especially about some of the um, analysis that I glossed over, we have an open source publication. Uh, we also have a really cool story map that is on our 3RQ website. Um, and this is uh, going over a lot of this information. So all of the tributary uh, graphs are included in this, uh, but it also includes some really cool information um, as far as industry in the basin goes. Uh, and then just uh, for those who may be new to 3RQ, we really enjoy uh, collaborating with students, watershed groups, um, you name it. So uh, please reach out to us if you're interested in using our data or if you have data of your own uh, within the Upper Ohio River Basin. And with that, I think we're ready for questions.